Welcome to Trinity United Reformed Church in Wimbledon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dominic Grant. I'm the minister at this church. It's uh, great to be able to, to welcome some familiar faces and uh, many guests who certainly I haven't met before. Welcome to Trinity and welcome to the London Borough of Merton, the local authority which pioneered what's known as the Merton Rule planning policy adopted in 2003 that requires new commercial developments over a thousand square feet, uh, square metres I should say, to generate at least 10% of their energy needs on site from renewable energy sources. That's a great forward thinking stride for environmental responsibility. Merton's record uh, perhaps is, is not quite so uniformly optimistic uh, as that Merton rule might indicate, as uh, it's interesting to find through a freedom of information request that in terms of uh, Merton Council's pension fund, uh, they're not necessarily one of the greenest pension funds around. But uh, some progress made, other progress perhaps still to be made. But tonight is all about environmental responsibility, focusing in particular on how we can ensure that our pension schemes and our savings and other investments make a positive contribution to climate care rather than being implicated in unsustainable global warming. Our three panellists this evening are all leading practitioners in the field. Nick Robbins is co-director of the inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system for the United Nations Environmental Project. And the multinational perspective is his particular area of expertise. It's also his passion. He's described himself as a corporate historian, and he's the author of the book, The Corporation That Changed the World, How the East India Company Shaped the Modern Multinational. Juliet Phillips brings a campaigning perspective. With a background in political theory and environmental justice, she is campaigns manager for climate change with Share Action, whose stated mission is to make investment a force for good with a vision of a system in which long-term thinking is recognized as the best way to guarantee healthy returns and in which anyone can play a part in changing the investment system for good. And James Featherby is involved in putting ethics into practice within an investment setting Having formerly been a corporate, lawyer, a corporate partner with the leading law firm Slaughter & May, he's now chair of the Church of England's Ethical Investment Advisory Group. And he's also the author of The White Swan Formula, Rebuilding Business and Finance for the Common Good, and Of Markets and Men, Reshaping Finance for a New Season. Please welcome our panellists. Here's how we will proceed this evening. We'll hear first from Nick, then from Juliet, and then from James. And after each of them has spoken, the other two will be given a brief opportunity to comment on what we've heard. And then, after all three have spoken, we'll open it up for comments and questions from the floor before we finish at 9.30 p.m. But just to set the scene, uh, I am very pleased to be able to welcome here this evening uh, the Right Reverend Dr Richard Cheatham, who is the Anglican Bishop of Kingston in the Diocese of Southwark, where he is lead bishop with responsibility for the environment, and he's also a member of the Church of England's National Environment Working Group. And so uh, Richard has very kindly uh, agreed to be here and offered to say just a few words of encouragement to us all. Bishop Richard. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dominic, for the welcome, and thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, I really do believe this is a hugely important area for us all to engage very deeply with. Uh, many years ago, I used to be an investment analyst with Legal & General, 
which made uh, this evening, um, as well as the things I'm doing in climate change at the moment and the environment which uh, Dominic's just mentioned, uh, irresistible because you've got a wonderful panel here and I'm certainly looking forward very much to uh, what they're going to say. It seems to me that uh, it's such an important area for us to get engaged with, but it's actually quite difficult to get there. And one of the challenges for me is how to get the very good thinking into the main bloodstream of our society and our church. One of the talks that I give is entitled, Your Gospel is Too Small, uh, echoing a book some of you may know by J.B. Phillips uh, about Bible translation, which said, Your God is Too Small. And the idea is that our environmental concern is not just a matter for a few people on the fringe. It is absolutely fundamental and flows out of the core understandings of the Christian gospel, our responsibility uh, for the climate, for the environment, for one another, intergenerational responsibility and all those things. So that's the sort of wellspring from which things flow uh, for me. But the real challenge is how to get it really systemically mainstream. And that's one of the challenges I've set myself uh, in the Diocese of Southwark. Uh, uh, we have a jolly good policy, uh, but getting it embedded is the task of quite a few uh, years, I think. Similarly, in the Church of England nationally, and I'm sure in all of our churches, but much more widely, and of course we're gonna have that represented in the panel this evening, which is, which is wonderful, uh, getting it embedded in our financial systems, our economic systems, our political systems, and so forth. And that's the challenge. And I think what it takes to do it is groups of people, meetings like this, time and time again, working away to a goal which is absolutely hugely important. So I'm very much looking forward to what uh, the panellists are going to say. Very grateful to Dominic and the team here who've put all this together. I mean, fantastic job to put this together. And I hope uh, through uh, what's being recorded, it will be widely shared with many, many people. And it'll be a time of genuine uh, encouragement and inspiration uh, for a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks to the organisers. I know Mark Smith and Alvin Thurston put in a huge amount of effort uh, to make this, uh, make this happen. Uh, I'm a Wimbledon resident. Uh, I'm currently working for uh, the United Nations Environment uh, Programme, really thinking, as, as Bishop Richard was saying, about how we bring the financial system in, in line with issues around sustainable development, issues of poverty elimination, and, and issues of climate change. We work with central banks, like the Bank of England, with, with the Treasury, here to think about uh, rules. I'll be speaking here as a uh, Wimbledon resident, just in terms of my background. I started working in the city in the year 2000, uh, working in fund management, so managing uh, people's ISAs, uh, maybe insurance contracts, people's pensions, um, and, and really climate change was part of that. We published what was called the first carbon footprint in investment fund about 10 years ago, so trying to measure how many emissions were associated with, with our, our portfolio and trying to reduce those. Uh, I then, for my sins, uh, went to work for HSBC, uh, where I uh, led their climate change work, and after seven years, I realised that HSBC did not stand for Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, but it stands for How Simple Became Complex. Um, so I hope today we can take this very complex subject uh, and not make it simplistic, but I think all uh, sort of empower all of us to think of what we can do uh, as individuals, as individual uh, pe uh, people with insurance uh, contracts, maybe for a house or whatever, uh, with pensions, with ISAs, with, with bank accounts, with members of, of communities like, such as churches, and also local citizens uh, of Merton who have investments themselves, and what is the ro our role in shaping uh, those investment uh, policies. So I very briefly want to look at the international scene, um, and then I think uh, we'll have Juliet and James really looking at some of the detail of what's happening here in the UK. 
and hopefully just answer sort of three questions. Uh, firstly, why is climate change a serious investment issue now? Um, what is happening uh, about it? Uh, and what's next? So really trying to answer those uh, three, three questions. What I'd like to do is start really last December in Paris. The governments of the world came together and agreed this Paris Agreement on climate change. Uh, we've had negotiations for years and years on climate change, but this was the first universal agreement. All countries of the world, almost, uh, almost all countries of the world, came forward with their own plans, and the agreement uh, said that we need to uh, stop emissions of carbon dioxide going into the upper atmosphere, causing climate change, and we need to, we need to hold those temperature warming, which will be the result of that, to about two degrees. We're, we're on course for one uh, degree already. What is very interesting about that agreement is the first climate change agreement which explicitly says the goal is to make financial flows consistent with a low carbon future and a climate resilient future. Partic resilience meaning making sure that people are protected from the impacts of climate change, flooding, sea level rise, droughts, floods, etc., particularly, obviously, in developing countries who are most exposed to these risks and have had least, uh, least contribution to making um, them happen. So at the heart of the Paris Agreement, this great international uh, agreement, is, the, is this goal of making financial flows consistent, so relevant very much to what we're doing today. Breaking that down, um, what does low carbon mean? What does the Paris Agreement mean? Essentially means this century, uh, the earlier the better, we need to have zero emissions of, of, of carbon, particularly from fossil fuels, from oil, gas and coal, but also uh, essentially ceasing emissions from deforestation uh, as well. We have a carbon budget, what the scientists say is the maximum amount of these carbon dioxide emissions we can put in the atmosphere, uh, and organisations such as uh, Carbon Tracker, which I'm on the advisory board, have estimated that the fossil fuel reserves that we have are far greater than we can ever use. In fact, we need to leave at least three quarters of the fossil fuel reserves, the reserves we found of oil, gas and coal, uncommercialised if we're going to stay within that carbon budget and avoid these potentially catastrophic impacts uh, on, on society and on the, on the environment. So that's the first reason why this is an investment issue, because obviously uh, investors and others have placed value on these reserves, and these, the, this value might, might uh, reduce, and in fact in some cases already has. We're already had seeing bankruptcies of, of, of coal companies. So that's, that's, the, so that's, that's, that's one reason, keeping the emissions down. Uh, but also, if we leave the emissions un, un, unchecked, then clearly we are going to see increasing impacts, the exacerbation of, of extreme uh, weather events, uh, and the Economist Intelligence Unit has identified that perhaps around $43 trillion, a huge sum, could be at risk if we leave emissions unchecked. So again, from an investor point of view, if you're a long-term investor, you're thinking about your, your pension, um, you're, a, you're a particular church, which is, really has no end in sight, hopefully, in terms of your investment, you need to be very careful about these, uh, the, the, these risks. So that's, that's, that's what we need to do to, to shift uh, on the carbon side. On the resilience side, um, as I say, uh, we're seeing increasing, uh, increasing risks um, insurance companies are increasingly uh, bearing that uh, and again if we don't uh, keep emissions in check uh, then in many ways the insurance business model uh, will, will cease uh, to be functional. Most insurance companies now realise that unless we keep climate change under control we're not going to essentially have an insurance sector. So that's, in a sense, the broad area of, of why we need to drive down emissions. We're going to need to have to leave most of the fossil fuels, which previously we thought were valuable, in the ground. Uh, and we're going to need to do a lot more to make our societies um, resilient to the increasing shocks of climate change. So three, I think, maybe conclusions from that. First, this is now a serious issue of risk and return. That's what investors look at day in, day out, how to generate returns for their clients, for people like us 
worse, um, and how to manage risk and return. This is now a serious issue of risk and return, and I think it's giving a redefinition of what it means to be prudent, what it means to be prudent in terms of thinking about new factors in the investment world. It forces us to take a new view on the time horizon. Uh, the city is famously short term. Climate change is not just intergenerational, but the impacts will spread over centuries, in fact, if, uh, even thousands uh, of years. And again, how do we extend our time horizon so these, are, these issues are factor in? And it's an issue of value, value creation, but also of values. Of, of individual values and how those can be expressed through our financial uh, transactions, how the values of organizations such as churches can be expressed uh, through their, their investments, and how they, they, those values uh, for, uh, and respect for future generations and, in fact, for creation as a whole can be uh, put at the heart of the financial system. So that's sort of the why, why this is now a serious issue. In terms of the what, what we see uh, happening, a number of aspects, which I'm sure Juliet and James will elaborate and go into much more detail. First is, is the press, pressure to decarbonize investments, to take carbon out of uh, investments. A number of initiatives, uh, we at uh, UNEP have launched a portfolio of decarbonization initiative to, to constantly reduce the amounts of emissions coming from pension funds uh, around the world. There's a pressure uh, for um, uh, investors to also divest, to actually sell their holdings in coal, oil and gas. I think now uh, the mainstream view uh, is that holding coal is not only a very damaging prospect for the environment, but also is, 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 uh, makes no sense whatsoever um, from uh, an economic perspective. Very interesting, last year, AXA, a big French insurance company, a shareholder-owned company, they sold all their coal assets. So a very interesting signal. This is not a fringe uh, issue anymore. Uh, in the UK, uh, another London authority, Waltham Forest, they've decided to actually divest of all their uh, fossil fuel assets uh, as well. So a reallocation process uh, underway. Alongside that, there is a reallocation towards green assets, towards the investments uh, we need to make in terms of renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, public transport, uh, and, and so on. And one of the things that is very exciting at the moment is how countries such as China are really taking a lead. Clearly, China faces many serious local environmental issues. Uh, the WHO, World Health Organization, has estimated that perhaps a million people a year are dying prematurely of air pollution in China. So again, bearing down on fossil fuels makes a huge amount of sense for human health, but also uh, for the climate. Uh, and China is now really the world's leader in the issuance of uh, green bonds, bonds which are raised and then are invested in uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and so on. So that's about the reallocation process. Uh, investors also can, can engage uh, with the companies they own through shareholder resolutions, um, and, and that has been uh, rising uh, through particularly the UK and the US a lot this, this, this season, uh, and also engage with uh, bodies such as credit rating agencies. These are the people who give uh, ratings about the credit worthiness of, of companies or, in fact, countries, and again, saying how do we get climate factors into the ratings they give or, of, of companies. Again, what can, what can investors do in terms of becoming more transparent uh, themselves? Uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning when uh, we published the first carbon footprint investment fund in 2005, we expected lots of people to follow and no one did. Last year, $10 trillion of assets around the world have decided they're going to be transparent. So I think a basic thing for all the investment funds that we're involved in in different ways, whether through our insurance contracts, our pensions and so on, is publish your carbon footprint. Understand where your risk uh, might, uh, might lie. The next step is obviously for those organizations to engage in dialogue with their members, uh, pension funds to engage in dialogue with their members. And a final area is, is perhaps investors getting involved in policy. And I think I would judge that actually the Paris Agreement would not have happened without the very far-sighted in engagement, particularly of institutional investors and many of the groups that work with uh, Share Action, really saying to, to governments that unless you put in place this, this policy framework, we don't have really a serious future as investors because of the serious impacts of climate change. 
So that's, that's what's happening, and I'll leave the others really to go into much more detail about that. I think in terms of what next, we certainly got to the recognition stage of the problem, increasing recognition by financial community that this is an issue. But if we think about actual action, it's still quite low. About 10% of the top 500 investors around the world have actually done this initial footprinting exercise. Money is moving. It is moving away from high carbon towards low carbon. And these are, are assets which actually do deliver returns. You don't need to give up returns in this process. Um, but again, this is perhaps less than 1% of total invested assets. So it's still a very tiny uh, proportion. But what I think is interesting now is actually how this is becoming part of a mainstream uh, agenda within the financial sector. You have people such as Mark Carney, when he's not busy uh, with the Brexit debate, talking about the risks of climate change, the threats that climate change pose to the financial system. But very interestingly, in a speech last week, really saying how green finance can not only contribute to financial stability, because actually you're reducing the risks of, uh, of, of runaway climate change, but also can help uh, stimulate the type of economic recovery and development that so many countries in the world uh, need at this stage. So I think we're in a very hopeful phase, uh, but we're still really only in the big beginning in turning, turning from as a commitment uh, into action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Handheld mic? Lovely. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to give uh, Juliet and James uh, the opportunity to pick up on anything that uh, Nick has said uh, before we move on to. Thanks. Well, thanks for the very useful uh, team setting there. It was good to hear many of share options recommendations to pension funds mentioned in your uh, presentation. So, we also recommend that um, pension funds like us from Coal and they're engaging with the policy framework. I think it's very interesting to hear that you were very, very much ahead of the curve, and um, where you were 10 years ago, you kind of where uh, pension funds were only just beginning to get to the stage of. So there's a real need, even though they're just beginning to take the baby steps to really accelerate from measurement to actual management of these risks. I mean, something else really interesting, um, which I think comes up a lot when people are talking about climate change, is the need to redefine uh, how people think about the investment system, particularly in terms of long-term versus short-termism. So, for example, BP and Shell, they consider a three-year incentive plan, sorry, a long-term incentive plan, to be just three years. And obviously, when you're considering things like climate risk, that just does not um, capture the full risk horizon. And the same is seen all throughout the investment chain. So, um, you see quarterly reporting and things like this incentivizing very short-term focus on profits. And there is a concern that without those more structural changes, it will be hard to get to change the kind of uh, mindset of investors to really consider longer-term ESG struggles. Um, so, yeah, I think they were the, the key points I picked up on. Shall I pass the mic over? Thanks very much. Yeah, I'd just like to observe um, how necessary it is in order to produce real change to make sure that we have a financial system that is um, where, where the economic drivers in the system are helping the cause rather than hindering it. And that is going to take um, some big changes. Um, and I, actually, I had a question for you, Nick. I mean, where are we now on carbon pricing? Uh, carbon pricing is, is a sort of, I suppose, a, a key policy. I mean, the economists call uh, climate change a market failure because the costs of pollution uh, are not priced in the goods um, that, uh, that we buy. Uh, and so we can price carbon through taxes, um, and so actually through road taxes in the UK, which are quite high carbon prices, but the gas we use in our houses isn't taxed at all. So it's, it's, it's often quite random in, in, in many ways. But what is happening, I think, is increasingly uh, countries are realising that if you do need to introduce taxes, then carbon taxes are actually a pretty sensible thing to do. Uh, you're seeing actually increasing uh, numbers of developing countries issuing taxes, uh, carbon taxes. So India has a carbon pricing system. Uh, it's small, but it's actually much more uh, entrenched than, say, the United States, which has very little. 
Uh, and you're seeing increasing numbers of so-called carbon uh, trading schemes, where uh, permits, uh, limits to pollute are, are, are handed out or sold to businesses. We have one in the European Union, but China is introducing one uh, next year, some of the US states have, and so on. So I think it's becoming uh, more uh, broadly based, um, and, and I think it's seen as a, as a necessary part of that, 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 that area. Because again, unless things are going to be priced, there's going to be limited incentive for our investors to shift their, their capital. Thank you both. Uh, time now for us to hear from Juliet on uh, how we can all be catalysts for change. Thanks. I'll see if I can get my PowerPoint presentation up and running. Great. And um, thanks, Nick, for the very useful scene setting. Um, my name is Juliet Phillips, and I'm campaign's manager at Share Action. I joined Share Action two years ago to help with the filing of shareholder resolutions on climate risk at BP and Share. Um, during my time at Share Action, I've worked on a number of different campaigns, including factory farming, corporate lobbying, responsible tax, and of course, climate change. So I'm going to begin by just giving a brief overview of Share Action for those in the room who aren't aware of our organisation. Then I'll outline Share Action's work to date engaging with pension funds on climate risk, laying out some of the key challenges and how they might be overcome. Next, I'm going to want to talk about Share Action's work to change corporate behaviour using shareholder activism and investor engagement, overviewing some of our work to date and considering this in the broader context of discussions about divestment. And then finally, I'll wrap up by offering a few practical ways that you can get involved using your investments, no matter how small or large, in order to help catalyze the low-carbon transition. So, Share Action is a charity promoting responsible investment. Our um, vision is of an investment system which is truly sustainable, considering the long-term impacts of investment decisions on the environment and society. Um, we um, started off 10 years ago out of a campaign run by the organization People and Planet, um, looking at the USF pension scheme, which is for university pension funds, and asking them to take a more ethical approach to investment. Over the years, we made a name for ourselves by ranking the pension funds on their responsible investment policy, and renamed ourselves from Fair Pensions to Share Action to reflect the broader um, aspects of the chain of investment which we now work with. Our theory of change is made up of three different aspects. The first is building a movement for responsible investment. Our mission is obviously much bigger than our capacity allows, so we need to get lots of people involved in making these changes happen. A good example of this is our AGM Army movement. So Share Action owns shares in all of the FTSE 100 companies, and this gives us the right to go along with the AGM to these companies and put an issue on the agenda of the board. We train individuals to go along and ask those questions and conduct useful follow-up meetings. The next part of our theory of change is unlocking the power of investors. Investors can harness their power to eat through things like shareholder activism and investor engagement to encourage companies to change their behaviour. A recent example is with our living wage campaign. When we started this, only three companies in the FTSE 100 paid the living wage, and now there's 30 following shareholder activism and investor signed letters. The final part of our theory of change is reforming the rules, governance, and incentives inside the investment system. So this looks at things like fiduciary duty and redefining how the investment system is engaging with legislators. So before we dive into the details of Share Action's work on climate change, I wanted to just um, lay a bit of context um, for the kind of challenge and conservatism of the system that we're working within. So I don't know if you can see the PowerPoint presentation here, but it offers some rather alarming statistics and quotes from a recent study published by Professional Pensions, which conducted a survey of 101 pension fund trustees. Over 50% said they didn't consider climate change to be a financially material risk, and 76% of the respondents said that they shouldn't be legally obliged to account for environmental, social and governance issues. I'm not sure if all of you can read the quotes, but um, one of the uh, comments was, climate change is an overblown nonsense whose so-called catastrophic consequences are perpetuated by the climate change doom-mongers who need to keep the discredited idea going just to justify their jobs. 
So, while there are some leaders in the space, such as the Environment, uh, Environment Agency Pension Fund, who are aligning their investment portfolio with a two degree limit in temperature rises, these are far outweighed by the number of laggards. This sets some context to the scale of the challenge that Share Action set ourselves in 2013 when we published our Greenlight Report, which sets out recommendations for climate aligned pension funds. The first step on the journey is for pension funds to measure and disclose their exposure to climate risk, putting this into a comprehensive strategy to deal with the implications. Truth be told, many pension funds are still yet to take this first step. The second recommendation for pension funds is to engage with high carbon sectors on the changes needed to ensure they're aligning for a a low carbon business model. In the case of the fossil fuel sectors, pension funds need to ensure that capital isn't being allocated to high cost high carbon projects are needed in a two degree world. Over the years, Share Action has been alerting investors to the risks associated with projects including tar sands and Arctic oil. More recently, attention has turned to BP's frontier project in the Great Australian Bight. The third recommendation is for pension funds to divest from thermal coal. As we heard from Nick, there is no climate or investment case for investing in these companies. And to date, firms worth $2.6 trillion have pledged to quit coal. The next of our asks is to set targets to divert capital from high carbon to low carbon investments. The Swedish pension fund AP4 is a clear leader in this space, stating it will allocate 21.8% of its global equity portfolio to low carbon investments. The final shareholder uh, um, green light recommendation looks at the policy influence of pension funds. It encourages funds to engage with regulators in support of a policy landscape supportive of the low carbon transition. Greenlight's recommendations are still very relevant today. Following COP21, there should be extra emphasis on ensuring that investment strategies are consistent with a sub two degree limit in temperature rises. It's fair to say there is still an uphill battle in getting pension funds to accept and act upon the material implications of climate change. Nonetheless, given what's at stake, we have to keep pushing. Share Action has identified a, key, a few key levers, which I'm going to run through now, where we think that change can be activated. The first is member meetings, and here we have um, a picture of some people meeting with their pension funds and demanding to um, put their issues on the table to be debated. There's no quick wins here, but we found it an effective way of getting the conversation started and presenting arguments in favour of considering climate change as a material risk. The next issue is legal challenges. Trustees of pension schemes have a legal obligation called a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of members. These are often interpreted very narrowly, prioritising short-term financial returns over the longer-term financial risks that climate change poses. Share Action is currently working with environmental lawyers, Client Earth, to challenge these conceptions. Another issue I thought I would touch upon is board diversity or lack thereof. Despite industry efforts, the investment system remains dominated by white middle-class men, often of a similar background and generally conservative to social and environmental concerns. Not saying that every um, person in that description fits that, but um, it is a true fact across the industry. And tackling this has been identified by some as an inroad for getting climate change and other social concerns onto the agenda. I'm now going to move on to talk about Share Action's work to catalyse the low carbon transition through shareholder activism and investor engagement with companies. There are a few key tools we could use to help catalyse these behavioural changes. The first is shareholder resolutions. In the UK, these become legally binding as 75% of investors vote in support of the resolutions. However, it's quite hard to get them filed. You even need 100 shareholders in the company or shareholders with um, a total uh, voting rights of 5% of the company, which is a very high per- per hurdle. Shareholder resolutions at two, in 2009 at BP and Shell were unsuccessful in um, getting the companies to disclose more information about tar sands. However, they did help raise the issue of this controversial project amongst the investment community. In 2015, Share Action worked with the Aiming for A Coalition in helping coordinate filings of shareholder resolutions at BP and Shell once again. With the backing of management, these were passed with nearly 99% of the vote. This year, we've supported resolutions at Exxon and Chevron, calling on the companies to disclose to shareholders their resilience to business models under low-carbon demand scenarios. 
Another tool is AGM interventions. With just one share in a company, you can go along to an AGM and catapult the issue onto the board's agenda. In fact, I own one share in BP and Shell for this purpose, and uh, this photo is actually me having a chat with the chairman of BP about um, the Great Australian Bike Project. <laughs> of course, it's much more powerful when companies hear these concerns from institutional investors and pension funds rather than myself. Given that investors generally have better access to meet with companies than regular shareholders, it sends a strong signal to the companies if investors choose to raise the concern at the AGM in this more public setting. Once again, this isn't about instant wins, but it's about instigating the follow-up dialogue, which can help lead to useful discussions. AGMs are also a really useful media moment. So, for example, at um, the a at the BP AGM this year, we drew attention to the Great Australian Bike Project by um, working with Sea Shepherd to put a huge inflatable whale on the lawn of outside and asked an array of questions by shareholders inside the hall to challenge the economic sense of this project. The final engagement I wanted to quickly touch upon was coordinated investor letters. So last year, Share, Share Action coordinated a group of investors to write to a number of FTSE 100 companies, challenging them on the inconsistency of their position on climate change. Many of them have glossy brochures which say that they support climate action, but behind the scenes are members of trade associations which are lobbying against these important legislations. Following this interaction, the French oil giant Total updated its corporate lobbying ethics policy to distance itself from these obstructive trade associations. Most discussions on engagement concern the fossil fuel sector. However, a successful transition to a low-carbon economy will require the transformation of a whole spectrum of industries. In particular, we must focus on transforming the demand side as well as the supply side of the energy mix. If we can drive down the demand for oil and gas products, it will be much easier to argue for the managed decline of high-carbon projects and companies. This will require focusing on sectors like utilities and automakers. There's also an important role for the banking sector if we're to create a two-degree aligned economy. Banks can set tougher lending criteria around projects and companies that stand at odds with a low-carbon future and can also play a positive role in ensuring that capital is available where it's most needed to create a low-carbon economy. So engagement, why bother, you might ask if you're a divestment campaigner. Whilst there are clear business alternatives and opportunities for sectors like utilities and the banks, the same can't so easily be said for the oil and gas sector. To align with a sub-two degree, bus to sub degree business model, fossil fuel companies will need to stop exploring for more hydrocarbon reserves and wind down production for consistency with low demand scenarios. This cap capital could then be returned to shareholders or invested by the companies within, um, into a low-carbon portfolio, so things like renewables. There's a strong case for encouraging investors to oversee that fossil fuel companies are carefully managing this trans transition to a sub-two decree strategy. The alternatives are not pretty. If we allow fossil fuel production to continue at current rates for a while longer, followed by a sudden and severe termination of the sector with dire consequences for both jobs and economies, or we could continue to produce fossil fuels as we do today, leading to dangerous levels of temperature rises. Engagement strategies that are focused on ensuring the first of these scenarios certainly seem consistent with a just transition to a low-carbon economy. Debate surrounds whether oil and gas companies have the capabilities to diversify into these unfamiliar markets. However, Danish company Dong Energy has shown it's not impossible moving from fossil fuel into renewable generation, using oil revenues to fund wind and solar investments. Similarly, French oil giant Total this year has made it a commitment to aligning its portfolio with the IEA 450 scenario, a demand outlook which leaves a 50% chance of limiting temperature rises to 2 degrees. So what does good engagement look like? First, it needs to be clear in its objectives of asking companies to transition their business model for alignment with sub-two degree scenarios. Companies should be given deadlines for transitioning to a low-carbon strategy with meaningful implications if they fail to act. For example, investors could commit to completely reducing exposure and ultimately divesting from companies that have proved unable to show that they're making the relevant changes over, say, a four-year four window. When investors say they can't divest but engage instead, 
We must hold them to account on whether they're pursuing meaningful dialogue with the companies and utilising their rights as shareholders to really push for change. I want to call, end with a call for action. First, to pension savers. Through our pension funds, we all have a stake in the investment system and have a right and responsibility to demand that the people investing money on our behalf are doing so in a way which is aligned with the low-carbon economy. You can join one of Share Action's teams of pension power savers to meet with your fund and drive forward a progressive agenda. If you don't want to commit to a meeting, there's an even easier option of emailing your pension fund. Share Action hosts tools on our website to allow savers to get in touch with their pension fund at the click of the button. For asset owners and those in charge of investments, make sure you're engaging with your asset manager, making sure they're taking a proactive approach to managing climate risk. You could use the um, framework set out by our Green um, Light Report for some examples of the requests that you should be demanding. For asset managers saying that they're saying all the right things about climate change, make sure this is supported by action. For example, proxy voting on climate change shareholder resolutions, such as the ones at Exxon and Chevron, were a good example. Finally, for people supporting engagement with um, fossil fuel companies rather than divestment, they need to be able to explain to their clients and beneficiaries how their engagement plans are aligned with sub-2 degree limit in temperature rises. Whilst engagement can be meaningful, this isn't always the case, and we can't allow it to be used as an excuse for inaction. Well, I hope that's inspired you to use your pension power, and I look forward to hearing your comments and answering any questions. Thanks very much, Bruno. And once again, uh, an opportunity for the other two panellists just to uh, come back with any immediate comments. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, incredibly helpful and uh, uh, comprehensive review of what's going on. I just wanted to pick up on one of the topics that you mentioned around fiduciary duty. Um, most pension funds and investment management houses are bound by this thing called fiduciary duty. Um, you might think that that meant that they did what you as beneficiaries wanted them to do, but I'm afraid the system is a bit more Victorian than that. Um, trustees are legally required um, kind of to ignore you and to do what they as trustees believe to be in your best financial interests because they know best. Um, this is a very odd situation. Um, and a lot of people have been arguing around this topic. Um, the Law Commission fairly recently did actually come forward and say that trustees um, are free, don't have to, but they are free to take environmental, social and governance issues into account insofar as they are financially material. Uh, some people still think that is not good enough, and I know uh, Share Action is doing a fantastic job on uh, a further work on democratising this kind of discussion. Um, what, one of the other issues related to that uh, I wanted to pick up on is, is even if trustees want to take these issues into account, why are they not doing so? And one of the reasons is that the, um, there's just a skills gap. Most pension funds are uh, advised by a very small number of investment consultants. They, they might have lots of asset managers who are actually managing the money, but they're, they're advised by a very small group of investment consultants, um, mostly actuaries, and I do love actuaries, this is not big actuaries. Um, but they just don't have the expertise or the um, interest in drilling down to the level of detail that we're now talking about. Um, they spend their time talking about asset allocation, in other words, should you be invested in gilts or Japanese equities or emerging markets or US treasuries? They operate at that kind of helicopter level. Um, I've been to many uh, trustee meetings and almost never are people talking about uh, individual companies, what individual companies are doing and their individual impact on society and the environment. You might think that's a harsh conclusion, but historically, until we get the uh, climate change today. Historically, um, what's happening in one company is irrelevant in terms of the portfolio of many billions of pounds. And therefore, these issues have never surfaced at the kind of level that they need now to be 
be servicing that. So um, I think we still have more work to do on uh, developing our understanding of fiduciary duty, and I think we still have a large skills gap that we need to plug in. I wanted to uh, pick up the, the work you were doing on the shell application because I think it was very interesting. There's a lot, a lot in there, some very interesting points. Firstly, that we now have this, this global agreement that we need to keep decentralised below two degrees. And I think all the work you were suggesting in the shell resolution is to ask these companies to put forward sort of the, the explanation about how they would uh, profit and generate returns. Uh, for the shell, but in that two-degree world, the so-called two-degree stress tests. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is going to be more and more uh, the device uh, to try and bring these future implications into today's uh, decision-making. So I think that's, that's one important. And I think also, I think it's very good how you emphasise that there is the almost duty of investors uh, to engage, uh, to, to hold uh, management to account, but not to leave this at the T and Biscuits level. But actually, if there is uh, a, 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 a no response or an adequate response to lay out a timeline as we suggested, and then unfortunately, in some cases, we'll need to move on and take your capital elsewhere. So I think that sense of actually engagement, engaging clearly, uh, bringing the future into account, but then if, if actions aren't taken, uh, moving on, and there are clear consequences in action. So that's been my experience. That uh, uh, you actually get, uh, for professional management, you actually get quite a good response. People realise that we're serious, this is not just endless chat. How do we do that as individuals, Nick? Does that have to come from institutions? Well, there's a, there's a great campaigning organisation I believe you can join. Come along for me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's sound enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, let's, let's hear now from, uh, from James. Well, I chair this rather strange uh, group called the Church of England's Ethical Investment Advisory Group. And what I want to try and do this evening is just give a brief perspective from um, the viewpoint of an institutional investor who is committed to being a responsible and ethical investor. Just a little bit of background, um, the Church of England uh, has three things called National Investing Bodies, or NIBs, uh, the Church Commissioners, a Pensions Board, and then some other funds that are managed by CCLA. And together they have assets under management, I think, of around about £10 billion. Pounds. Now, I chair the EIAG, uh, and that gives Christian ethical advice. But we only advise. Uh, it's the NIBs, the investing bodies, who decide in the end what policies they want to adopt and how to implement them. So we op operate at a kind of strategic level. Uh, the individual company by company ethical decisions uh, are taken by the investing bodies. Also, we don't give uh, financial advice. Um, so although we're fully aware of uh, things like the stranded assets discussion, uh, we don't express a view on it. Now, we had a, an environmental policy for quite some time, but we uh, began a much more focused discussion uh, around climate um, around 2013. And we ended up developing a policy which was adopted by the investing bodies in 2015. And I, I thought it might just be helpful to explain some of the phases, the three phases we went through in developing that policy. Uh, first of all, um, as we always do, we reflected in depth on the biblical and theological position and on the church's traditional teaching. The second phase was evidential. Uh, we spoke to a lot of scientists and experts to find out what they said. Um, but we also spoke to those who are most directly affected by the issues that we are discussing. And then thirdly, um, a kind of pragmatic uh, phase. In an imperfect world, what is the best ethical response for us as investing bodies of the Church of England, who have a particular ability to act and speak, both as part of the witness and mission of the Church, uh, but also as significant institutional investors. And all of this is within that context that I was explaining just now of being uh, under fiduciary duty uh, having to get the best realistic 
financial return for beneficiaries. The Church as an Investor is, of course, a charity, and that gives us a little bit more room to take into account ethical considerations uh, than some other investors. Well, through this process, we, we certainly learned the truth of that maxim that I'm sure you know. For every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear and simple and wrong. <laughs> Um, we reached six key, uh, conclusions, uh, and this is what shaped the way that our policy developed. Uh, first of all, we concluded that climate change and poverty alleviation were both key priorities, and it's not helpful to try and prioritise one over the other. They're both deeply interconnected, as indeed everything is connected. The connections are spiritual as well as social, uh, economic as well as technical. So we thought it was important that we uh, didn't make sustainable development impossible for the hundreds of millions who still have inadequate access to energy. The second conclusion uh, was that the urgent task was an orderly transition to a low carbon economy. And here I want to emphasize the word transition. Ethics involves starting from where you are, even if you have a great aspiration. And as part of this, the Church of England's investing bodies decided to make a very public commitment that they wanted to be at the forefront of institutional investors working for that transition. The third conclusion was that we should divest from energy companies substantially uh, committed to the most polluting fuels, coal and tar sands, uh, because it's not really realistic to think that they will make that transition. The fourth conclusion was that the right ethical approach for the investing bodies was to engage with major fossil fuel producers, high energy users and policy makers, but to do that with a clear option, as we've heard earlier this evening, clear option to divest in due course if companies are not uh, sufficiently responsive to the need for transition. Now, we're keen to emphasise that this is uh, not the only right ethical response. Uh, different actors in society, as always, have different and varying roles to play. But we concluded that we did have a role, uh, uh, a kind of combined role, as both the church and as an institutional investor. And in fact, we concluded that it was our ethical duty to try and stay invested and use that voice rather than walk away from that opportunity. Our fifth conclusion was that our policy needed to be flexible. We needed to have a clear sense of uh, direction of travel, but we needed a policy that was flexible enough to allow us to work with other like-minded investors who might see things similarly but differently, but also flexible enough to be responsive to changes on the ground such as the development of international benchmarks, which it would then be great for us to work alongside. And if I could say something here just about um, engagement rather than uh, divestment, uh, we are shortly going to be launching a transition pathway initiative that we are hopeful is going to make a significant contribution to the dialogue between investors and business. And this initiative is going to involve a tool that will enable us to analyse both industry sectors and specific companies against set criteria on a consistent and objective basis. And it will enable the investing bodies to assess whether individual companies are committed to making this trans transition and the specific progress that they're making. We've developed this tool with uh, the LSE and with the Environmental uh, Agency Pension Fund, and we're hoping that a, a broad range of other institutional investors are also going to join the initiative. Now, I mentioned six conclusions. Um, the sixth one was actually put rather neatly by Pope Francis, uh, and referring to all of us. He said in his 2015 encyclical, the problem is that we still lack the culture needed to confront the crisis. There can be no renewal of our relationship with nature without a renewal of humanity itself. And this takes me to my final point. What can each of us do? Uh, we, we've heard what we can do on the pension front, but what more personally uh, can we do? And here I'm going to speak perhaps a little bit more personally. 
The climate crisis comes from a mixture of supply from the oil companies, demand from us as consumers, all within an umbrella of regulation, supported or not by us as citizens. And I think it's too easy for us to think that we're doing something by making angry demands of other people. The real question is, what can we do ourselves? And I've got two suggestions or two questions. Will each of us live a life of joy and sufficiency and so reduce our demands for energy? And secondly, will we tell our politicians that we will pay whatever it costs to shift the whole of our way of life to a low carbon economy and an economy that su supports sustainable development for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thanks, James. That was really good. Um, shout out to Sophia, a big supporter of the Church of England's work, and we think, compared to a lot of pension funds we, we work with, you're very much part of the care. Um, again, very much aligned with your position and engagement and uh, wish you the best with the uh, Transition Pathway Initiative and hope that we can also help to push more investors into using that tool. I suppose there's always questions about what the timelines are for engagement and particularly when you have a company like Exxon or Chevron who are slightly less um, conducive to a, uh, a discussion than say Total or even BP and Shell. So I'll be interested to know if you do have that kind of um, um, timeline in mind, whether it's kind of not in the public domain. I'm going to give you an answer which may not be terribly satisfactory, but um, our experience of engaging with companies over many years on these kind of issues is that it's not helpful to make the discussion public whilst you're having the discussion, because then it kind of it raises the level of heat to an extent in which it becomes impossible to have kind of meaningful conversations with people. Um, all I can say is that I know the investing bodies are deadly serious about this. Um, they recognise that some companies are probably never going to make a transition, uh, whereas other ones will. But to kind of announce in advance um, you know, what, what hand of poker you're holding is, is not, we think, the best negotiating tactic. So, um, we will make it up as we go along, as we see the, um, you know, the, the response that is given. And often these things take, take longer than one might hope. What we have found though on many, many occasions on engaging with companies is, of course this debate is already going on with the company. They're, they're not immune to this debate. And what we find is that um, hopefully we can arm that part of the company that is asking for change. And we do that um, partly as an ethical investor, but also as a long-term investor, saying this matters to us, not only in relation to this particular investment, but as we look at our portfolio as a whole, um, whether it's banks or, um, or energy companies, um, you are in the danger of um, endangering the whole of our portfolio, and that's why we take this so seriously. Thank you very much, James. I mean, for me, I think this one, one observation and actually a question. Um, I think it's really important that you highlight the links between climate change and poverty. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's essential. Um, and, and also, I suppose, links with the, the sort of wider human condition. I think it's perhaps interesting to reflect that actually this is the 60th anniversary of the beginning of Britain's low carbon transition, the passage of the Clean Air Act uh, in 1956 which actually was the peak in coal consumption in the UK, four years after the, the great smog of 1952, where 4,000 people died at least uh, from, from, from air pollution and climate change. Obviously, the CO2 itself doesn't get us. Uh, but that process of, of transition has led to huge human health impacts, benefits in the UK, but as we know, many, many communities are still scarred by a disorderly uh, transition away from uh, fossil fuels in the UK. So the importance of really thinking through how to use the word just transition. Uh, my question actually would be what impacts you've had in the wider uh, church faith uh, communities. I mean, you, you're 
advising and advising funds of 10 million, I think so. But I think there are often a number of church communities, uh, maybe sort of other faith groups or community groups which might have small amounts of mass investment or you made the point, often people don't have capacity. What, what, what are sort of lessons or guidance for those, those groups, maybe here or others, to actually what steps can they take uh, to follow some of the leadership and leadership? Well, to misuse your old happy phrase, we're better together. Um, so the more that we can um, do this with others and, and you can do it with others, the better. There are, there are lots of initiatives around. Share Action is a fantastic one. If, if you're representing a, a church investment board or a charitable investment board, um, there's something called the Church Investors Group that you can uh, join. Or, or if you find the whole process of managing your money just too exhausting, uh, you know, there are investment funds out there who will manage your money in accordance with um, the Church of England's investment policy, so you can get other people to do the work for you. So there are, there are lots of options, but um, always best to do things with others. Thank you very much to all three of you. I'm going to take this roving mic and rove a bit now as it's <laughs> time to open up the conversation to questions and comments on the floor. Uh, the gentleman just there was the very first to shoot his hand up again. Very quick. Absolutely. Do you like to, to uh, just tell us who you are? Hi, I'm, I'm Stephen Cobb. I'm involved in a lesson from a quite focused on the site pension fund, which is a 2.8 billion pound fund. We're encouraging them to divest from what we store their carbon assets. I'm, I'm hugely respectful of everyone and uh, lots of positive things have come out. I want to come back on the point of engagement as a policy because it doesn't work. And I'm, I'm throwing that spanking at us. We've been engaging, we've been engaging well, oil and fossil fuel companies for 25, 30 years with, with little or nothing to show them. And, and I appreciate and respect the comments of everyone here. But I can tell you, we need two black books here and we won't stop on one of them. Benefits, the projects that have been stopped because we persuaded oil and gas companies to, to uh, finish with fossil fuel harvesting, or the projects that have started and been curtailed. Take that list and we look at another one on the line with all the, advance, with all the advancement of oil and gas companies, what exploration they're doing, they're going into Africa, they're going everywhere. All that stuff far, far outweigh anything that's been engaged in engagement. Anything that's been achieved through engagement. Absolutely. So, whilst I know that's a very negative comment, it's only, I'm only making that because I think, really and truly, the focus has got to be getting money out of it. It's in society. You start taking the money out of things, and things change. And that's almost exclusively the only way to change things in this society. I do respect the, the, the comments you're making about you know, changing the financial system. And I know that's negative, but I'd just like to come back on that with respect. Which of you would like to come back on that? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, institutional investors in, engaging with companies um, is not a silver bullet. Uh, there are many, 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 many other things that have to happen. Complete redesign of the however many uh, dozens of mega cities that are going to be built in the next 10 years, most of which are in China. There are many, many issues that need to be solved. Um, so, this, this engage, disengage, uh, uh, invest, disinvest debate, uh, it's an important debate, but it's not the only debate. The second thing I would say is um, I know you guys have not had the success that you wanted, but the world has changed. When NGOs were asking uh, fossil fuel companies to do something about it, they were really just shouting from the sidelines. What has changed is that the owners of these companies are now asking change, for change. And our view is that it's worth, uh, it's worth the time and the effort to have another go because we are the owners and that makes a difference. I completely respect the diversity and I think it's done some really important work. Um, 
I think when we consider what the kind of aims of the Paris movement are to kind of delegitimise the social licence of the fossil fuel companies, there's been amazing progress there and also just push, pushing the issue on the agenda. So before, pension funds didn't hear from anything from their members. Now suddenly they have to develop some kind of strategy around climate change and what they're doing about their portfolio holdings for oil and gas. So I'm completely not against divestment and I do think there's a strong case of divestment where engagement is shown to fail. Um, I guess one of my concerns is that even if you know, quite a lot of people do divest, these companies are still going to exist and they're still going to be out there exploring fossil fuel reserves and um, you know, flowing more barrels of oil into the economy. So I think there is a role for a few responsible investors to kind of stay involved in the dialogue and keep at least causing some concerns to the companies because otherwise they're just going to be unpleased if we don't see the kind of legislative changes from policy makers. Um, from my experience, I've just been reacting to my hand with the engagement investments, which is why I was a bit quiet. But um, um, I think the important thing is to link engagement with, with action and a realistic uh, signal to companies that actual um, uh, capital will be re reallocated. That's been much, much in my experience. Uh, you can engage with companies at a certain point, I think there's a respect that actually if, you, if management is not giving you a reliable, trustworthy response, you have a duty to, to, to move your money. So I think engagement on its own, uh, it is, I would say, is not going to be uh, sufficient to be backed with a real uh, commitment to reallocate capital, because that's what we need to do. Either the companies reallocate capital internally to new uh, projects, as you say, to tower or to energy, or they need to reallocate capital back to the owners who can then uh, reallocate sort of things. But that is the, that's the key. We've heard the, the D word a few times about divestment, and uh, we do have uh, among us uh, one of my colleague uh, ministers in the United Reformed Church, uh, whose church uh, was actually one of the first to divest from fossil fuels. So uh, before we uh, come to other questions, and I can see there are a few, I wonder, Alex, uh, Alex Mavis from the Right Hand Centre in Brighton, do you want to talk about that as well? Thank you. Um, yes, we, uh, I'm a minister. Um, Church and Community Centre in Brighton. Brighton. In 2014, we divested um, from oil. We had some holding in the oil company, and we sold that. We later sold um, some other mining shares, and bit by bit, I think we're almost there. But um, for us, it was um, a case of, of uh, a line, trying to align what we had in terms of to use Christian Figueres language to align our financial assets with our spiritual assets and while you know we were while we were seeing the harm that carbon emissions are doing in the world particularly to the world's poorest people and to the most vulnerable um, species in the world um, and we were campaigning on all sorts of fronts in connection with that in, in locally and, and further afield and looking to our own carbon footprint as a, a centre and looking at all this, it didn't make much sense for us to be to be giving financial support to an industry that we felt was was actually in many ways unethical. And we didn't want to be lending them our money in essence by our own their capital. So for us it was a case of, of making that ethical decision. Um, to withdraw and, uh, and put money to better use. And I wondered whether you felt there was an ethical case for that investment, particularly in the light of the withdrawal of government support for the renewable industry that we've seen this last year, whether there is a case for institutions to pour out money uh, from the oil industry anyway, regardless of what could be gained through engagement. But and to put that money just in supporting the development as rapidly as we can of renewable alternatives. Thanks. Yeah, I completely agree that that's the um, most ethical thing to do, to speed up the drug transition to a low carbon economy as quickly as we can. I mean, there's the practicality of the fact that these are massive companies which are going to take a while to, you know, wind down 
dis, um, distribute their assets or um, their workers to find new jobs and things, and that will in itself take time. But I completely agree with you that policy needs to, you know, the indicators need to rapidly shift towards the low carbon economy and things like subsidies for fossil fuels completely not part of that solution and um, where we see the governments cutting any subsidies for renewables that's completely misaligned. So I agree there's a strong policy angle there but I also think there could be a role for engaging with companies around the just transition to a low carbon economy. I mean, uh, there is an ethical case, and I think ethical investors and particularly church investors have been doing this for decades on, on the risks of tobacco, arms, and, and, and other uh, products which seem to be harmful against social practice. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is not a new uh, issue. I think maybe I'd like to sort of raise, raise the point that actually, I think we're assuming that moving away um, from high carbon polluting assets is necessarily going to lead you to the loss of return. I don't think that's the case. That certainly hasn't been uh, my experience. And I think one of the things that's happening now is as you are having a, a growth in, in new sectors, I mean, people talk about renewables a lot, but I think energy efficiency assets, where actually obviously there's, there's a strong financial uh, case, um, quite a few uh, products now are available where you can move out of high carbon assets and into energy efficiency and the performance of those those styles and offerings has been quite good. So again, I, th I think clearly the ethical case, you shouldn't be thinking perhaps about the, the, the financial impact, but I don't think we should, we should leave this room thinking that there's always going to be a, a net loss. I think actually increasingly you, you can actually generate in line with the issues quite uh, attractive uh, returns through rebalancing the portfolios. Yeah, I'm, I'm a sort of conservative enough Christian uh, not to believe in moral relativism. Um, so against that background, um, that doesn't therefore mean that everybody has to say, have the same ethical response to a particular problem. So if, if for example, um, a, you know, a group of people flew into Sudan to visit a refugee camp, what should be the right ethical response for each individual going? Well, if one of them was a politician, perhaps there was something political he could do. If one of them was a Hollywood filmmaker, perhaps he should go back and make a film about it. So, although you might, we might all share the same analysis of the problem, the response which we each individually should make uh, needs to fit with who we are as a person and our skill set and the voice that we have. And the decision that we took, and as I say, it's not the only ethical uh, response that, that, that's available. But we concluded that we had a voice because we were a large enough investor and enough other Christian investors we, we knew would, um, would kind of follow us. We concluded that we had a voice and therefore and we didn't want to give it away. Now that is different to, you know, if you were a small charity um, and to be honest you have no voice, I can understand why in that kind of situation trustees might reach a different conclusion, but having a voice and giving it away without trying to get something in return just didn't seem to us to be the right answer for us. But I, I, I would want to emphasize, we are engaging with a purpose for transition. We are deadly serious about that. So we have a voice and we intend to use it and uh, there will be teeth attached to it. Thank you. Just uh, attempting to interpret something. I'm sensing that there may be uh, a tension between uh, the ethical impetus towards divestment on the one hand and the strategic or pragmatic impetus uh, towards staying invested in the same platform from which we engage. Is, is that a fair sort of analysis of the, the tension there? Uh, I, would, I would say, certainly in our, in our case, we we, we believe that the response we're making is an ethical response. So um, to call it pragmatic, if by that you mean compromised, I would disagree. <laughs> okay, sorry, just... <laughs> so I'd say that again. Um, if the distinction is being drawn between an ethical response and a pragmatic response, um, with us sitting in the pragmatic, not the ethical response, uh, I, I obviously would disagree quite strongly. What I'm saying is that we, ha we have a particular position and a particular opportunity uh, and it, it, our conclusion was not to use that 
action would be unethical. Thank you. I'll come to uh, for this side first. Um, just to refer back to your point, James, about um, supply and demand, um, I, I wonder if markets anyway are, are beginning to see the writing on the wall. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit too optimistic here, but we see the, the growth of, uh, uh, of, of battery-powered electric vehicles in the world, a huge investment in Tesla, for instance, in the United States. Norway has already announced that it's going to ban the sale of petrol-driven vehicles, I think by 2020, or certainly in the early 2020s. And uh, there seems to be this sh shift going on driven by the market. A friend of mine has just bought his Nissan Leaf, and he's very pleased with it. And uh, I, I would certainly consider that if the, if the journey, if the, the, the mileage was sufficient to be able to do so. But the market is going in that direction anyway. Uh, so I, I wonder if, uh, you know, it's getting, companies like BP and Shell are going to become irrelevant anyway. And uh, maybe it's not fast enough. Uh, and, and my second question, therefore, is what, what further government regulation should be in place? How can governments regulate the market? Nick's already referred to uh, carbon tax. Um, is, is there more that should be? government should be doing to, to um, shift things. Yeah, that, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the real change here happens when the economics supports um, the situation that you're trying to achieve. And uh, clearly, demand and regulation are two very, very key factors in making that happen. Um, and, I mean, whilst it's, it's, it's great for us to make the ethical case, um, money speaks, and the financial case is, is always going to carry uh, more, rate, more weight, at least in our current cultural climate, uh, sad but true. Um, in terms of regulation, I mean, for me, again, there's, there is no silver bullet, but um, we are not car pricing carbon and, uh, properly, and we, we need to, and we're conscious of it on something, so we're conscious of it paying for it on, on cars or, or aeroplane tickets. Um, but we're not conscious of it when we're buying a whole host of other consumer goods uh, where the cost of carbon has been externalised to somebody else and we're not paying it. Which is why I made that comment about will we as consumers support our politicians as they bring in carbon tax, even though that's going to cost us. And it's going to cost us if we're also going to support sustainable development elsewhere, it's going to cost us more than it's going to cost Africa. Are we prepared to do that? Maybe a couple of reflections. Um, I was very struck uh, this week by the passing of Shimon Peres, the Israeli statesman. And one of his uh, comments was about the tight links between oil and terror. And, and the funding of terrorism, and that, that is the prompt for him for driving the electric, electric vehicle movement is Israel. So I think, again, realising that climate change is one factor, but there are many, many other reasons why you might want to go down a low-carbon pathway, human health, smog, uh, energy security, certainly, again, I think another example, very interesting, India, the, the power and renewables minister, has announced that they want to move to a fully electric vehicle uh, fleet by 2030. Uh, and again, that, that is a country which actually has huge development needs, huge poverty still, recognising that that makes sense from a uh, balance of payments, energy security, uh, access uh, to transport, but also pollution and climate change point of view. So I think those, those, bringing those things together is, um, is, is, is particularly important. Thanks. I think you um, brought up a really good point about um, the kind of demand destruction that we're seeing for oil and gas products at the moment and how other companies and many of their investors just really aren't quite recognising how quickly the world is changing. I think that's a really important reason why the kind of talking about how the companies are going to manage that transition and how investors are going to reduce their exposure to fossil fuel companies is very important. There's this analogy of um, investors picking up the pennies as the bulldozers coming along and they do need to realise that change is happening and this Kodak moment where 
fossil fuel industry just isn't relevant anymore. It's probably a lot closer around the corner than many people think. Um, but obviously that's great and we want to continue destroying demand for fossil fuel um, products. So um, I would just say maybe more focus on engaging with um, energy, sorry, um, the energy uh, suppliers, so um, utilities and automakers is a really good focus for shareholder activism going forward to push them into renewables and electric vehicles, getting big companies like Volkswagen to continue producing more electric vehicles and putting research and development funding into those areas is a really good focus for investors. And you can also say, you know, we can't engage, maybe there's no point in engaging with all the sectors because there isn't capacity or whatever, but there may be some key focus sectors would be the ones on the demand side. Um, I wonder whether we can talk about urgency. Like, we talk about the need for this transition, but there's no talk about whether this is going to happen over 50 years, 20 years, 30 years, 10 years. Do we need to be you know, Do things need to be turning this year or next year or in 2020? And I wonder whether you can each give your perspective on where we need to be in terms of the speed of the transition. I can say say my opinion, but I think it'd be interesting to know your use of that. Speaking of speed, I'm going to take uh, two or three questions just at once and ask you to. We started by hearing from Bishop Richard about the need to get the idea of a response to climate change into the mainstream of the church. What more significant way of doing that? Can you imagine the national investing bodies to decide to divest from the the fossil fuel companies and to invest in renewables. Would they be accused of breaching a fiduciary duty? Well, has Alex Mapp's church been accused of that? Have the Society of Friends, have the Church of Scotland? Has is this worrying the water and forest pension fund? Of course not, because their economic arguments are clearly pointing in that direction. And now that is what as a, as, as an admin and therefore as wanting to see the Church of England actually do something, I think that I can think of nothing better. And really, this aiming for A is a very, very poor substitute. I'll give you the opportunity to come back on, on those two questions. <laughs> Well, I think the second was more of a statement than a question. Um, on, on the first point, we, we will be led by the science. So that's why we have a flexible policy. We will watch what the science says, and that will set the, the speed at which we respond. What do you think the science does say? Sorry? What do you think the science says? What, what do you think we get from science at the moment in terms of speed? That it's urgent. 10 years? 50 years? Well, what's what urgent? Mean? I mean, no, no one, to be honest, no one really knows, do they? But we, we all know it's urgent. We need to achieve peak uh, greenhouse gas emissions this decade, and we need to bring them down to zero um, by 2050, hopefully, but certainly in the, by the end of this, 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 this century. Now those, again, a lot of these, these urgency points are based on probabilities. Um, and, and, and one of the things that a lot of the models are using is, is these low carbon pathways, but often they're based on a 50-50 chance of achieving the target. Now, we wouldn't get on a bus if it only had a 50-50 chance of arriving safely at the destination. So I think the question is, is, is about our tolerance for risk. Um, so other people have been choosing two-thirds probability of achieving it. And actually, if we are really serious, we might want to achieve much nearer to, to, to 80%, which obviously means that our carbon budget becomes much smaller and the time we have becomes much, much less. Um, so I think there is, there is a huge urgency, um, particularly in terms of deployment of renewables. We need to uh, put in about a trillion dollars a year, uh, and we need to take out about $500 billion a year from, from fossil fuels. So it's very, very, it is very serious. But this year, this decade is peaking global emissions and coming down as quickly as possible to zero 
and potentially below, because we've got to suck carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere, which we still don't quite know how to do. Yes, to repeat, I'm not a climate scientist either, but uh, the latest reports that I've been reading suggest that we do need to fully decarbonise by mid-century if we are to stay within the two degree carbon budget. And um, need the, the peak emissions does need to take place by around 2020 if we are to limit temperature rises to under two degrees. And obviously the decarbonisation process has been going on for a while, but the managed decline needs to start, well, needed to start 20 years ago. But we start from where we are, so the, the quicker we can push for change, the better, obviously. I think it's important also to note that um, a lot of scenarios used and called two degree scenarios do contain levels of risk which we shouldn't be satisfied with. So the IEA 450 scenario is an important one to be aware of because it's often used as a two degree compliance scenario when actually it only needs 50% chance of um, allowing us to limit temperature rises to two degrees and that depends a lot on um, things like carbon capture and storage and um, biofuel technologies which don't even exist yet. So um, yeah, being very sceptical about anything which contains mythical technologies. <laughs> Good, good point of person to die, sorry, and uh, I've also got to speak. Um, as we prepare to step out um, tonight, um, what did you think to give us a concluding thought on an action which members here individually of this audience could take, whether it's joining um, some of the excellent um, uh, you know, share action uh, groups or whatever? from a spiritual perspective, from a governmental perspective, what are the actions you would, you know, you would recommend that we as individuals take? Okay, so I'll give the panelists just a moment to, uh, to concoct that one individual action, take home message each, and why are you thinking about it? Um, thank you all for um, your speeches. I uh, would just like to emphasise um, that I do believe very much in this idea of joy and sufficiency and the fact that you know, a lot of our economy is based on deliberately encouraging unnecessary consumption. Um, you know, it's at the heart of what we're facing. And one thing that's come up uh, this evening was mentioning about sort of green cars um, but I'm not sure if anybody can actually prove this, but I have heard that the energy in producing the car really equates to driving it for its entire lifetime. So in terms of what we can do, I think we should all go and investigate how much energy goes into producing cars. You know, so an electric car may not actually be the solution. Um, another thing which I think is very important I don't know if you can comment on this, but ISDS. Is everybody aware of what ISDS is? Um, it's basically the idea that um, governments can be sued for taking any action which impacts on the profits of international investment. Um, and it is very important here because at the moment the US is being pursued um, by TransCanada over the tar sand pipeline. So the US has uh, put a moratorium on tar sand to buy that pipeline and there's now under the ISDES mechanism, please do look it up, investor state dispute settlement, there's a 15 billion pound, uh, sorry, dollar um, threat of um, reimbursing the Trans Canada for the loss of profits. So, what we can do is be aware of what ISDS is and watch for it in any trade deals that our current government is very keen on pursuing. Um, that's, uh, I suppose, is one thing. The only other thing is has everybody heard of the circular economy? Because, again, this is something. Um, to take to our MPs and say we would like an economy 
which is far more joined up and holistic so that not only the carbon is priced into goods when we buy them, but the whole life cycle of all products, including um, disposal costs, is there right at the start. So we actually think about what we're buying before we buy it, the full life cycle. So two demands for our NPs are, can we have a circular economy and can we not have any nasty ISDS mechanisms? Thank you. This is one for Nick, actually. You might have touched on it earlier, and I sort of just missed the answer. Um, I used to work in derivatives, though not energy derivatives. And there used to be something called carbon emission derivatives, whereby um, one country, or the country has a percentage, say 100%, it hasn't used up all of its allocation, it's got 75%, and it can sell off the 25% to anybody else it wants to. Um, these things are fraught with misuse, but have we not that particular one on the head yet? I think we have a nod of the head to, make, to answer that question that has been put to me. If we, we hear the uh, points that have been raised about uh, ISDS and the circular economy and the query of the, the um, energy involved in the manufacture of uh, particularly electric uh, vehicles, uh, and then you've got a little while hands to think about your, your succinct take home message uh, for what each of us can do as, uh, as an action. Uh, going forward from here. So uh, I think that covers all that we've just heard and will be a good way to, to round off our panelists' contributions. Do you want to talk about the derivatives as well? Uh, so I think what you're talking about is an extension of this, this notion of carbon pricing which James raised earlier, which is this uh, cap and trade system uh, whereby that actually companies are allocated permits and you can, you can trade those. And internationally, uh, these are the primary mechanism before Paris was a carbon offsetting uh, scheme. Uh, it's, it, it's really come, uh, come a cropper, really, uh, for two reasons. One, uh, there was quite a lot of fraud involved, uh, and secondly, actually, there was, there was insufficient demand. It still could, can work, uh, but there are a lot of methodological issues which make it quite, quite hard. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's resting uh, at, uh, at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, TTIP, uh, the Transatlantic Trade Investment uh, Partnership, uh, I always thought it would be good to actually ch change that into a Transatlantic Transition Investment Partnership, so there's a great opportunity there, and our European colleagues, certainly in France, have been very much clearly link linking uh, the, uh, the, 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 the provisions you've mentioned with, uh, with, uh, with climate change. Uh, circular economy is very important. I think, again, is, is is important for us to recognise that we need to link these things together. The studies I've seen is if we pursue action on climate change, simultaneously we action on circular economy, so we're using materials in a circular way, uh, we achieve more jobs, growth, and more economic benefit. Uh, I'm going to cheat in terms of my, my recommendations. I think all of us, perhaps, who have investments, should be asking the people who manage them, what are you doing about the implementation of the Paris Agreement? And, and secondly, all of us who are maybe members of church or faith bodies asking the treasurer uh, of that organisation what you're doing about. I'll certainly be doing that uh, later this evening. Yeah, I'll just comment on um, what do I suggest you do. Um, th I think there is always a temptation to, with these issues and other similar issues um, to have a response which is to ask somebody else to do something. And those, those are good responses. Um, but I think Jesus teaches that real change comes when each of us individually allows God to change our own heart. So I, I would go back to um, the challenge really, are, are we going to live with our community of fellow believers or community or street or whatever community you belong to, are we going to become people and a community of joy and sufficiency? For me that's the real cultural driver and out of cultural change comes all of the other changes. But joyful with less. Joyful with less. Yes, I'll be joyful with less from now on. Um, 
I don't have any um, insights into TTIP, but I think one point for um, electric vehicles as well is to be aware that just because the smog's been taken away from the streets doesn't always mean that um, you know we're actually burning less emissions. For example, in China, they've done quite a lot to introduce more electric vehicles into the cities because of the smog problems. But to generate that electricity, they're still burning coal in order to create that um, supply. So I think it's very important that we're very aware that you know something which looks shiny and clean isn't always what it seems. So just to be aware that electric vehicles by themselves are not the solution. Um, and then my message for people of something to do would definitely be to join one of our pension power teams because you know there's just so much more power when we work together, when we go and talk to our pension funds collectively and have a really strong list of logical arguments and climate change reasons that they just can't ignore. There's so many pension funds that are still fast asleep at the wheel. They might say that they do things like engagement, but they're not really actually doing that much. And if you can go in and challenge them with people who've got all the arguments behind them and you're equipped with people who are experts in this, it just shows that there's a real demand from clients and that's what's really going to drive the lots of asset owners to actually you know, engage much more with asset managers about the risks and opportunities associated with the low carbon transition. Thank you all very much. Now, coming towards uh, the end of our time together, speak from this way. Uh, just a couple of closing notices. Uh, with Juliet's current commission, we can uh, make available the PowerPoint presentation that, uh, that she's used. Uh, so, if you would uh, like to receive, uh, preferably electronically, I would guess, a, a copy of that PowerPoint, uh, do let me know. Before we, before we go, um, Alban is saying the script as well. But that's that's, yep, that's fine. <laughs> um, as we uh, advertise with advance publicity, uh, we're very glad that you all took up uh, our invitation this evening to attend uh, free of charge this wonderful event. Uh, but we'd like to give you the opportunity, if you feel so moved, to contribute to a retiring collection. Uh, towards the costs of, of running this event, uh, and I'll be a couple of bags of plates uh, at the uh, back of the church just before we leave. Um, and a few thank yous to say. Uh, I'd like to uh, say thank you first of to uh, Kevin, who you'll have seen uh, wandering around the building carrying all sorts of photographic equipment and tirelessly moving microphones and so on. That is so that we can make uh, this evening's proceedings available in due course via YouTube uh, to, to ensure that it reaches uh, a wider audience and indeed to ensure that if there's anything you didn't quite catch first time around, then in due course you'll be able to, uh, to catch up with it the second time around. So thank you to Kevin. Thank you also to a couple of our church members here, uh, to Alan who's been operating the microphones at the back, and to Katrina, who's been live tweeting throughout. So again, if you want to uh, catch up with anything that you may have missed, uh, you can uh, find us on Twitter afterwards, uh, at Trinity Wimbledon, but the Wimbledon without an O, because Trinity Wimbledon with an O wouldn't quite fit within Twitter. <laughs> minutes. But, uh, do follow us for that, and find out what Katrina has been tweeting for us. Uh, thank you also to uh, Alburn and to Mike, uh, who have uh, worked with me to uh, help put this evening's proceedings together. And we're very grateful to both of you for all of the insights and energy that you've brought to that. Thank you to all of you for attending, and not only attending, but participating. And I dare to say, not only participating this evening, but going from this place energised and ready to put into practice uh, the uh, suggestions and the ideas that you have heard from our panellists. And finally, uh, thank you indeed to our three panellists once again, to James and to Juliet and to Nick for bringing your expertise for bringing your passion and for bringing your encouragement to all of us uh, in ways that empower us all to make a difference towards the common good. Thank you to the three of you very much.
Yes, uh, I wonder if I'm available. Uh, Bishop Rinchin, just to offer a short closing. Almighty God, we give thanks for the goodness of your creation, for the wonderful world which we live in, in all its diversity and all its life. We hold before you the challenges which our planet faces now, our island home. And we pray for a deep conversion of heart within each one of us, within our systems, the way we relate to one another and to our environment. And we pray that you would help each one of us to play our part in bringing about the world that you would have us live in, that all may live that fullness of life, which is your will for all people through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. That is such a good thing to put on there. And a great idea.